The gospel lesson for today is familiar. Uh, comes from the third chapter of John. We'll read verses 16 and 17. Hear the gospel of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I recently read a book by Henry and Melvin Blackaby. Henry Blackaby was at our seminary banquet a few years ago, and I really liked him. When I came across this book titled Experiencing the Resurrection, I liked it so much, I, I decided to share it with you, especially at this time right after Easter. So here are these words from the Blackabees. They say, Without the resurrection, the cross is meaningless. The resurrection is proof of Christ's victory over sin and our hope of salvation. The resurrection, however, is not a doctrine to be pondered, but an invitation to experience the living Christ in your life. The resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead then seated him at the right hand of the Father and put him over all principalities and powers is the same power given to us. Should that make a difference in our lives? Should we be afraid of spiritual warfare? Is there anything we cannot overcome if we're walking with Christ? <coughs> just really meant a lot to me when I read that. Of course, the answer <coughs> is no, we should not be afraid. We can overcome all things through the power of Christ. And over the next several weeks, we'll be examining and experiencing the meaning of the resurrection. You know, each year, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. And then we often sort of forget about it or put it aside soon after. But the <coughs> resurrection is most important to our lives as Christians and is therefore something that we need to discover and uncover more for ourselves. And just as the layers of an onion are many, and so are the layers of the resurrection when you really look into it. So let's begin looking at the resurrection through the eyes of Henry and his son Melvin Blackaby, <coughs> and through their book, Experiencing the Resurrection, the everyday encounter that changes your life. And that last part, the subtitle of this book, can sound quite daunting, really, especially if you're not ready or expecting to have your life changed. But if you are, then get ready to experience the resurrected Christ. That's what this is all about. Our lives are not meant to look like the lives of unbelievers. Rather, they are to look like that of Christ. We are to live our lives in, with, and for Jesus. And by doing so, Jesus promises us abundant life. Blackaby says, So many Christians are missing out on abundant life in Christ because they haven't understood how the resurrection completes the cross. The resurrection is the key that unlocks the door, the validation code giving us access 
to what Christ accomplished on the cross, and it will profoundly transform your life. See, the resurrection is so powerful, and we need to apply it to our lives. True knowledge of God is transformational. It is always personal, it's powerful, and life-changing. In reality, it was not only Christ that was resurrected. We are also given that gift of being raised to new life in Jesus when we believe. And I know that is a bit much for us to grasp, but it is the truth. And when we live in the truth of Jesus Christ, we will be transformed. You know, anything that is life-changing has to be something more than just head knowledge. You know, Scripture is one such thing. When we study the Scriptures and stay close to them, we experience them and experience the world as God wants us to. And faith is something else that needs to be more than just head knowledge. You know, true faith is based not upon just knowing about Christ. You know, many people know about Christ. They know who he is. They know he was a teacher and a healer. But true faith comes only to those that experience Christ in their daily lives. It is something to be experienced, something that can and should touch every part of our lives. And here is where we, as Christians, often go wrong. Since we live in the world, most of our lives reflect the world instead of Jesus. And we need to change that. Christians need to look and act differently than the world in order to introduce Jesus to unbelievers. And in order to do this, we need to take advantage of the resurrection power that we have been granted when we accepted the risen Christ into our lives. And this resurrection power is not possible without the love that we receive from our God. We receive that love because God is love. Love is his nature. And the best part is that even though we are very far apart from him, he still loves us. John 3, 16 and 17 that I just read is the proof. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And the reality is, according to Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And according to Blackaby, the clearest difference between God and his creation is found in salvation. He is holy. We are sinful. He is all-powerful. We are are completely helpless. He's all-knowing, but we are ignorant of spiritual things. He is self-existent. We are totally dependent upon his mercy and grace. So how can a God that has created us and loves us draw us closer when the differences are so great? Well, simply through the gospel. <clears throat> it implies our greatest need. From God's perspective, we perish apart from him. 
And this is how God has drawn us closer. Through the cross, which was necessary because of the work of our sin in our lives, through the resurrection, which was necessary because the cross put Christ to death on our behalf, through Pentecost, which was necessary to bring us the Holy Spirit and implement the new life that came as a result of the resurrection. You know, I don't know if you realize it or not, but all people, and yes, I said all people, are created to instinctively know that there is a God. And that is why we can say that people make the choice either to follow or not to follow God. Either is a choice. Yes, we do have a tendency to sin. And God has given us a conscience to make us aware of that sin. When we stop listening to that moral barometer, we move farther and farther away from God. You know, Romans chapter 3 is a really great chapter. It teaches us that sin makes us unrighteous and separates us from God. It keeps us from understanding and seeking God, and it sets us on the road to corruption and causes us to lose our fear of God. And there's no way that we can personally keep ourselves from going down this path to destruction. The only hope comes from a gracious and merciful God. Listen to the words of Paul from Romans chapter 1, where he talks about this gracious and merciful God we have and what he does for us. Beginning with verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, 
just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. This teaches us that by accepting God's unveiling of who Jesus is to us, we are brought into a relationship with him that produces blessings. However, if we reject this revelation, then we are kept from a relationship with him and brought under the bondage of our own ignorance and lust, which cause us to perish. You see, to accept or reject is your choice. But there are consequences to your choice. Blackaby puts it this way, you're absolutely free to determine the direction of your life, but you are not free to determine the consequences of the choices you make. I know that's true. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I would certainly rather have God reveal himself to me through the good news of his gospel than through his wrath. You know, we find out one way or another who he is, and that he is. I'd rather find out through the good news than the bad news. Many people choose an ungodly response to the truth because they are afraid to give God control of their lives. I was. When I gave God control of my life, things got much better. People are content, as I was, with a self-centered existence. Because sin feeds selfish desires, and it feels like what we want. But as I said earlier, our choices do not free us from consequences. God determines the consequences. And in the passage I read from Romans 1, Paul said three times that God gave them over to their sinful desires their shameful lust and depraved minds. He allowed them to choose something over him, but in doing so, they are enslaved to what they chose. God doesn't want anyone to fall away from him, and therefore he shows his mercy, his loving kindness, his patience and grace to anyone who is willing to repent and to turn away from their sins. And he gives us chance after chance after chance. But when you do choose him, he will forgive your sins and restore the relationship. So if you have not yet done, done so, give your life to Christ fully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.